Good morning, or good afternoon, or maybe I should just steal a phrase from our Australian friends and just say good day, no matter what time of day it is. And we're grateful that you've joined us with our online service. You know, you don't have to go too far down your social media feeds or even watching the news to see the world in which we live in and how depraved it is and of how it needs so much hope, 
love, grace, and forgiveness. We've been asked to be the hands and feet, and we continue on the challenge that I posted last week to be Jesus' hands and feet and his mouthpiece to encourage those around us. I was so grateful for a couple of phone calls I received this past week of people just checking up on me. It really did mean the world to me, and thank you. As we continue our series on the Psalms of the Ascent, I wonder if we could echo the words of the Apostle Paul as he spoke to the church in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, he says to them that we are to take every thought captive and to make it obedient to Christ. As we think of the world in which we live in, and that God at this time isn't just giving us words of encouragement during this pandemic, but he is calling us to action. I wonder if we could continue on our challenge of being the hands, the feet, and the voice of Christ to a world that so desperately needs to hear a message of good news and hope, especially the hope that we find in Christ. Would you please pray with me as we continue our service? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are God, that you are the Lord even over this pandemic, you are in control. Lord, we ask that your hand would reach out to those who so desperately need you, whether they are struggling with health or with mental conditions or whether they just feel isolated and alone. Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church to be your hands, your feet, and your voice to a world that so desperately needs saving, that so desperately needs you. And Lord, we, as we continue our service this morning, we ask your Amen. Good morning. Thanks for joining us for our service today. Well, this past week, I was working with the Yudo team on some lessons from Nehemiah, talking about how difficult it was to construct the huge wall that they needed to build around Jerusalem. And we got to thinking, you know, if everyone in Jerusalem had access to the same technology we have access to, think about how much easier the job would have been. I mean, simple things like a wheelbarrow, a pickaxe, and a shovel. Gosh, if everyone in Jerusalem had had those, the building a wall would have been a lot easier. But at the same time, even though we have access to all that technology, things like a wheelbarrow doesn't necessarily mean we're more productive. After all, I mean, you have more technology in your smartphone than they had in the computers that NASA used in the Apollo missions to put a man on the moon. But it doesn't mean we're all as productive as NASA. In fact, I suspect that some of you at some point during this lockdown felt like your work was frustrated. You were stuck at home, and even though we have access to things that ancient people would have dreamed about, like the internet, um, despite having all these tools at our disposal, it doesn't necessarily mean we get more done. Well, we're going to talk today about a psalm that talks all about work. We're going to be looking at Psalm 127. Now, when you turn there in your Bibles and look at the title, you're going to see that this is a psalm of the ascent. And we've been going through the Psalms of the Ascent. These are these prayers and songs that the Israelites would sing on their way to Jerusalem to worship. Jerusalem is uphill from most places in Israel, so the Israelites are walking uphill toward the temple. But we also see in this Psalm that it says, of Solomon. Now, that either means this Psalm is by Solomon, or this Psalm means it is dedicated to Solomon. But either way, the meaning's the same, that this is a Psalm of wisdom about how to live well, how to get the most out of life. You know, wisdom is, is learning to do things the way they were designed to be done. And when we do things the way they're designed to be done, we find that we can sleep better at night, that, that things just go more smoothly. Well, let's just look at what this psalm says about work. Read with me, if you will, Psalm 127. I'll be reading in the message version. If God doesn't build the house, the builders only build shacks. If God doesn't guard the city, the night, the night watchman might as well nap. It's useless to rise early and go to bed late and work your worried fingers to the bone. Don't you know he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? Don't you see that children are God's best gift, the fruit of the womb, his generous legacy? Like a warrior's fistful of arrows are children of a vigorous youth. Oh, how blessed you are, parents, with your quivers full of children. Your enemies don't stand a chance against you. you uh, you'll sweep them right off your doorstep. Well, this psalm's all about work. And it starts by saying, unless God builds, the laborers labor in vain. Well, laboring in vain reminds us of that story from Genesis, the Tower of Babel. In that story, people realized how much work they could get done, and so they decide to use their work to build a tower. They say, let's make a name for ourselves and we'll be secure, we'll lord it over others. 
You see, the temptation of human beings is to use their strength, their talent, their intelligence, not in the way that God intended, but as a way to leverage it over other people, to make prideful actions. I'm going to build a great company. I'm going to earn some respect. I'll work in such a way that no one will tell me what to do. We call that, you know, the temptation of work in the Tower of Babel. But on the other side of this, I've heard people say psalms like this one, unless God builds the house, well, the builders just build shacks. And some people interpret that to mean, look, if God's going to do it, then, you know, I'm just going to sit back and take it easy. I'll do as little as possible. I'm going to relax and know that, hey, God's got this. Um, and, and what we want to say is that that's not what this psalm is saying. In fact, if you look throughout the Bible, we see that, that work is something that we do in participation with God. Sitting back idly thinking is, well, it reminds me of the story of a philosopher he hears the water running and uh, he goes in and sees his son in the bathroom, but the floor is flooded with water everywhere and he's looking around trying to decide uh, what to do and he's thinking. His son cries out, Dad, this isn't a time for thinking and philosophizing. This is a time to get a mop. You know, sometimes as Christians, we can do a lot of time singing or praising and, and not always being busy with the work that God has given us. That seems to be what happened to the Christians at Thessalonica. They got in their head this idea that, well, since Jesus is coming back and, and since he's taking care of anything on the cross, then we will just sit back and take it easy. God will provide for our needs. We'll just um, relax here. Now, critics were calling those Christians just a bunch of freeloaders. And Paul, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 to 13, says, you know, command those who are being idle that they need to work. They need to provide for themselves. And he even, if you back up a couple verses, he says, how could you possibly sit and be idle? Didn't you see my example when I was with you? I worked to provide for myself to not be a burden for you when I preached the gospel. Throughout Paul's letters, we see that Paul's work is a participation with God's work. In fact, that's how this psalm starts, unless God builds, unless God guards. The psalm is centered on God's activity. In the beginning, Genesis tells us, God made the heavens and the earth. The first week of creation is a week of work followed by a day of rest. That God is working, God is moving, God is acting, God is creating. And our work always comes second. That is, it always comes after God has started something. And our work, as Paul describes, is a participation with God. That when you go out to take care of your garden, to, to grow some vegetables in this winter months, or to, you know, to go out and take care of your yard, that you're participating with God. God creates the world and life, and we are cultivating it with our hands when you're able to, to work and to earn money for your family, you're doing it in a world that has resources that God put there. We are participating with God. But there's two things that this psalm really want to emphasize, that we're partic our work is always to participate with God and that it is primarily in terms of a gift. It uses the illustration of children. Children are a gift from God. Now, of course, parents have to do something if they want children, although we would hardly call that work. But there is work in raising children. But nobody can just create children because of their own ingenuity. We only receive them as a gift from God. And even the way that we raise children isn't just however we want to raise them. No, the way that we raise them has to be uh, following after the steps God created to help our sons and daughters uh, step into the image of Christ. We're following after God's will for our kids. And so we see in this image of the family, this idea of work is gift. But it's not just family, but all that God gives us, whether we're, we're building, whether we're, we're night watchmen, all of it is possible because of the gifts that God has given us in our lives. But we also see in this psalm that for God, work is centered on relationships. Children are a blessing from God. People matter to God. In fact, people are more valuable to God than the stuff that you have in your life. The world values work by saying, look, you can tell he works hard or his work is valuable because of how expensive his watch is or how nice his shoes are or how nice his clothing or car is. But God values work by how we use it to bless and to increase our friendships, our relationships, our relationships in our family. For, for God, it's always centered on relationships. And because of that, let me offer a couple of caveats that it's important that as we work, that we work with complete honesty. 
You see, it can be easy to get in the habit of work of, well, starting to bend into flattery where we say things that aren't true but make other people feel better, or we begin to exaggerate excuses. We lie a little bit to, to make our work look better, to help our career move along. But when we do that, we're just using our coworkers around us to get more done. If they were friends, we would be honest with them all the time, even when it meant saying, look, I didn't get this done, or no, I wasn't able to accomplish this. And I can tell you that in the long term, honesty not only helps your career because people learn that you're trustworthy, but it also means that your career grows with your friendships, that you can be friends with people that you work with. It also means that uh, as we work, that we don't shun the responsibilities that God has already given us. So no matter what opportunities come along, God, maybe if you're a parent, God has given you children. Well, we can't neglect those things at home because we have a new opportunity at work. Maybe you're a son or a daughter with aging parents, and you need to be taking care of those parents, and that's going to mean saying no to some opportunities. But in God's eyes, our work is valuable because people are valuable, that we are, we are willing to invest in those around us. And as you succeed in your career or your business, it is important that if, as far as is possible, that you take your friends with you, that you make sure to share that blessing with others. We don't just pay our employees the least amount that we legally have to. We pay our employees as much as we possibly can to share the blessings that God has given our business, that God has given our homes with others. Well, in this psalm, we have this wonderful uh, phrase about work that... that we can rest easy when we work with God. It allows us to sleep at night because we're not working alone. You may have felt some moments of anxiety during this lockdown period. And what I like about this psalm, it says, don't you realize that your work has always been with God? And so there's a lot going on in the world right now, but we trust that God provides. We trust that, you know, people always have mattered more than whatever uh, position or prestige we may have had outside the home. Now, this psalm, when it was originally written, was sung by people who maybe traveled a long way to get to Jerusalem and put a lot of work into it. You can imagine how easy it would be to begin to brag and say, you know, my family traveled over 100 miles to get to Jerusalem. And another family saying, well, we had to survive a pack of dangerous wolves to get here and thieves we overcame. It might be tempting to brag as you came into the city about who the real pilgrims were, those who were willing to go a long distance. But you can imagine if people started to say that, someone would chime up and begin to sing, unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord watches the city. You see, work is not an opportunity for us to brag about our accomplishments, but to say that everything we have done has always been with God and centered on who God is. Desna D in our church has said many times, if you've been around him, he says, when it comes to glory, the glory is not for us. Don't touch the glory. The glory in our work always belongs to God. Well, wherever you are during this lockdown period, I hope that you realize that God has given you an incredible opportunity with your friends and with your family. How can you participate in God's work where you are this week? Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is destined Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon What mercy for today been, Lord, and faithful you will be. You bear yourself to me, and that's why I see you. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, Tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name, still call the sea to still. I 
ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Oh, 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 oh. 